Good morning. I hope everybody had a good break and got a chance to get something to eat and visit our vendors. Uh, my name is Adina Hirsch. I am a former past president, although not immediate past president of Gaston. And um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Angela Bingham. Angela is a clinical associate professor, PGY2 critical care pharmacy residency program director, residency program coordinator, and vice chair of the Department of Pharmacy Practice at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, St. Joseph University. She practices as a critical care nutrition support clinical pharmacy specialist at Cooper University Healthcare in Camden, New Jersey, and she earned her PharmD from South Carolina College of Pharmacy in Columbia, South Carolina. She completed her PGY1 pharmacy practice residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, followed by a PGY2 critical pharmacy residency at the Regional Medical uh, Center in Memphis in conjunction with UT um, Health Science Center. Her practice teaching and research activities are focused on pharmacotherapy in critical illness, including nutrition support therapy. Her professional contributions have included chair of the BCS Specialty Council on Nutrition Support Pharmacy, president of the Philadelphia Area Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, Hafton, um, chair of Aspen Pharmacy Practice Section, as well as task forces for the Adult Critical Care Nutrition Guideline Revisions, Parenteral Nutrition Appropriate Consensus Recommendation, and Standards of Practice for Nutrition Support Pharmacists. She is an associate editor for NCP Nutrition and Clinical Practice and an assistant editor for Pharmacotherapy, a physiologic um, approach. Thank you so much for speaking with us. She's awesome and acid based and electrolyte, so always listen. <laughs> Good morning. Is, is this mic picking up okay? Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction and greetings from the Philadelphia chapter. It, it's uh, always a pleasure to get to join you here at, at the uh, Gaston chapter. Uh, it was exciting to learn last night in the conversation of the growth of this chapter that's been ongoing. Uh, we were sort of reflecting. I had the opportunity to join you back in 2019 pre-COVID, so it's uh, the pleasure to get to be back with you today uh, to talk about the topic of application of asset-based principles in nutrition support. In our session earlier, it was wonderful to hear of the diversity of professions that we have represented today um, with a good mix of dietitians, pharmacists, other providers, and uh, as a faculty member, I was um, loving to hear about all the students that we have in the audience today. Um, so we'll be sure to engage you throughout this session. I have nothing to disclose related to the content of the presentation today. And at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to describe metabolic and respiratory acid-based disorders. And given our heavy focus on the practical application of this material, you'll also be able to manage a nutrition support patient with an acid-based disorder and identify the most likely causes of those acid-based disorders for a patient that's receiving nutrition support. In order to accomplish these goals, um, we're first going to start by discussing the relevance of these disorders. Uh, we'll then move into some of the basic acid-based principles. And from there, um, with that um, baseline understanding, we'll get into more of the information about uh, diagnostics, etiologies, and the actual management of different metabolic and respiratory disorders. And we'll use a systematic and clinical approach and apply that to some patient cases as we reach the end of our uh, time together. Uh, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump into some discussion about the relevance of this topic. And I think this becomes clear when we think that about 90% of critically ill patients will experience an acid-based disorder. Um, but it's not limited to that patient population. Uh, so in a variety of extended care settings for patients that are receiving uh, home uh, nutrition support, there can be chronic conditions in place and medication therapies uh, that also result in these disorders. And unfortunately, if patients are experiencing these, it can have multi-organ consequences for them. Uh, impacting uh, cardiovascular status, pulmonary, kidney, and neurologic uh, disturbances potentially occurring. And unfortunately, 
uh, these can be associated with poor outcomes and unfortunately can be life-threatening. Uh, so as nutrition support clinicians, it's really important uh, that we are able to identify these in a timely manner uh, to be able to address some of those underlying causes, as we'll discuss throughout our time together. Uh, to further emphasize some of those adverse effects, I wanted to provide you as a reference uh, some of uh, the effects that can happen with severe acidemia and alkalemia. And these can occur regardless of if the condition is respiratory, metabolic, or mixed in nature. Uh, and as you can see, there's a whole laundry list of adverse effects. But I'll point out a few for our consideration this morning. Uh, there are a number of cardiovascular effects associated with severe acidemia, uh, with decreased cardiac output. Uh, also, there can be a decreased responsiveness of the heart and vasculature to our catecholamines. Um, vasopressors. Uh, other uh, features that we can consider, particularly uh, from a nutrition support standpoint, uh, would be the potential increase in potassium, the increased metabolic demands that are seen, increased protein breakdown uh, with severe acidemia, and insulin resistance that can occur. And if we look at the other column, that shows some of the uh, potential effects of severe alkalemia. Uh, of note, in this category, the hypocalcemia can result in some of the neurologic manifestations, uh, such as the seizures and lethargy that are listed. Also, with alkalemia, this depresses uh, respiration and can result in hypercapnia for patients. So these are uh, important to keep in mind as effects that we would try to avoid for our patients as we're addressing these issues. So I want to acknowledge early on that I know that acid base is a topic that oftentimes makes people cringe. <laughs> Any in the category of uh, cringing related to this topic? Some of that? <laughs> well, we'll try to make this as painless as possible uh, early this morning. And I thought uh, to do so, I would start by sharing with you in the simplest form what we're working with. Uh, so we have an acid being a substance that can donate hydrogen, and we have a base that can accept hydrogen. So the hope is that at the end of our hour together, uh, this will be as simple as this game of catch uh, that's being played here. And we will be focusing more of our discussion today on the simple disorders, but we will have a little bit of expanded discussion into mixed disorders and the use of compensation formulas. Um, but um, hopefully that will keep it at a manageable level for our discussion this morning. I wanted to review some of the terminology that's associated with acid base. Uh, pH, uh, representing the con concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. And we strive to maintain this in the normal range of 7.35 to 7.45. Um, at that uh, point, the body's proteins are protected and there can be optimal body uh, function. Uh, these hydrogen ions you need to be very tightly regulated, though. Uh, the range that's been described as being compatible with life is 6.8 to 7.8. I also wanted to clarify some of the terminology around acidemia, acidosis. Um, you may have seen those in the past used interchangeably, uh, but there is a slight difference. Uh, so acidemia is the pH less than 7.35, and the acidosis is actually the disorder that leads to that low pH uh, for a patient. Uh, similarly, if we consider alkalemia, the pH uh, being greater than 7.45, and alkalosis being the disorder that leads to that uh, pH value. Uh, next, I wanted to delve a little bit more into some of the basic principles. Uh, and related to that, I think we uh, need to be aware that hydrogen ions are a byproduct or end product of cellular metabolism. Uh, so the bulk uh, of this acid production coming in the form of CO2, uh, but from the catabolism of carbohydrates, fat, and protein. And to maintain this hydrogen concentration that's compatible with life, uh, there are several uh, regulation systems that come into play. Uh, there's the chemical buffering, lungs and kidneys, 
that all play a role. Uh, with the chemical buffering, uh, this occurs uh, with weak acid and base pairs that prevent large changes in hydrogen concentration. And the primary buffer system, and the one we'll have some discussion regarding today, would be the carbonic acid bicarbonate system. Also, the lungs come into play and have uh, a role regulating PCO2 for our patients uh, and have a role in changing the rate and depth of ventilation. And lungs are very nimble. They begin uh, to help with compensation within minutes uh, to help a patient that may be experiencing a disorder. The kidneys um, also play a role in controlling uh, serum bicarbonate for our patients and uh, provide some manipulation of uh, bicarbonate absorption and hydrogen excretion. Uh, but they are a little bit slower to act, so compensation occurring within two to three days uh, from a kidney standpoint. As we're having this discussion, I think it's really important to remember that careful clinical evaluation is key to recognizing an acid-based disorder that's occurring. Uh, first of all, we can consider the patient's history, uh, their history of present illness, their past medical history. Uh, pharmacists always have to think about their medication use and if that could be implicated. Uh, the signs and symptoms the patient is experiencing might uh, be able to help you, guide you toward recognizing a disorder that's happening. Uh, for example, from the vitals, we may recognize that a patient is in shock. Uh, we will want to review the neurologic status, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms that a patient may be having. Uh, we can review pulmonary uh, status and examine what the respiratory rate would be. Uh, so we would expect normal to be 14 to 18 breaths per minute. Uh, and as we'll move through our discussion today, uh, you'll hear how a change in that rate might be related to their acid base status. And also the physical exam uh, findings in general and laboratory data can be helpful keys as we're making that clinical determination to determine what the primary acid base disorder would be for a patient. Next, I want to talk about uh, ABG interpretation. And oftentimes, these will be reported as pH, PCO2, PO2, and bicarbonate. Uh, with the use of the electronic medical record narrative now, you may be a little bit less familiar with that documentation, but at some different points throughout our discussion this morning, I'll use this notation to describe uh, the order of those ABG values. For those who may be a little bit more familiar with this uh, area, do you remember with arterial or venous samples be preferred? Anyone remember? Arterial, uh, great, um, which is really important because that uh, reflects how well the blood is being oxygenated by the lungs, whereas the venous sample uh, provides more information about how the tissues are using that oxygen, and the results can be misleading in some cases. Um, for example, if uh, the extremity was impacted by hypoperfusion or infection or another cause, that could in impact our interpretation of the data. So the arterial sample uh, being preferred. As we discuss these values, it's oftentimes easiest to consider the mid-range value as the normal value uh, as we're having some of our conversation. Um, so with pH normal being around 7.4, uh, PCO2, which is the partial pressure of uh, CO2 in the blood, and that is the respiratory component of the buffer system uh, that we discussed. And with this, normal is around 40. Uh, PO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Uh, so this isn't involved in acid-base regulation, but uh, is a reflection of the ability of hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Uh, but just for your reference, that's oftentimes reported in that ABG uh, that you might be interpreting. With this, the normal is uh, around 80 to 100. And then we have the serum bicarbonate value, which is the metabolic component. So it uh, counters the PCO2 that we uh, just discussed. Um, and with this, normal is around 24. Any questions so far? 
are some helpful tips to consider for interpretation. Um, it can be very helpful to compare the bicarbonate that's shown on the ABG with the serum bicarbonate. Um, that would be part of the CHEM7 that is uh, also sometimes referred to as the total carbon dioxide uh, to verify accurate lab results. Uh, you would uh, hope that those values are very similar, but there is uh, a difference. Um, the one that comes with the CHEM7, the serum bicarbonate, is a measured value, whereas the one that's part of the ABG is a calculated value. And for that reason, it's usually one to two less than the measured value. Um, so with both of those available, we generally lean towards using the serum bicarbonate value uh, for interpretation, but it's helpful to match those up because if there was a wide discrepancy, it would make you think, oh, perhaps there was a, an error with the test result or something to be repeated. This slide provides an overview of the different acid-base disorders. Uh, we see that with uh, acidosis, the pH is decreased, and in alkalosis, the pH is increased. For respiratory disorders, the primary disturbance is going to be related to the PCO2 and acidosis with that being elevated, so think of PCO2 acting as an acid, and in alkalosis being decreased, and metabolic, um, the primary disturbance being bicarbonate, with acidosis that being uh, decreased and alkalosis increased. Uh, so a helpful memory device that you could keep in mind is ROM, spelled differently than our venue for today. Uh, uh, but in this case, respiratory opposite and metabolic equal. Uh, so that is in reference to the direction that the arrows uh, point for the pH and the primary disturbance. Uh, so uh, you can tuck that one away for your future use. Uh, next, to talk a little bit more about compensation, uh, because we know to maintain that normal pH, the body will attempt to compensate for the acid-base disorder. Uh, but it's important to remember that the body will never overcompensate. Uh, so related to that, the direction of the pH can always be used to help you determine what the primary acid base disorder would be for your patient. With the respiratory disorders, we have the kidneys, uh, as we discussed, coming into play uh, to regulate bicarbonate. But that compensation being slower in two to three days. For metabolic disorders, the lungs are going to have the impact regulating uh, PCO2, so changing that rate and the depth of ventilation to blow off um, more or less um, CO2. And that compensation happens quickly within minutes that we begin to see those effects. This table further expands on the previous one to describe uh, the compensatory response that's expected. Uh, so as you see here, for respiratory disorders, the bicarbonate will increase in acidosis and it will decrease in alkalosis. And for metabolic disorders, the PCO2 will decrease in acidosis and increase in alkalosis. Uh, we're going to mainly be focusing on the simple disorders, uh, but wanted to share with you some of those scary formulas uh, just so you have them in your toolbox uh, for future use. Uh, these are formulas that can help you determine if a mixed disorder is present. Um, with this, you'll also need to note for respiratory disorders if the condition is acute or chronic in nature, and that's because that expects your anticipated level of uh, compensation. Uh, also of note, in acute conditions, um, those generally require a little bit more immediate and aggressive therapy uh, than chronic acid-based disorders. Uh, to show you this table in action, I wanted to provide you an example uh, case to show how these formulas would be used to make the determination. Uh, so we're going to talk about a case of acute respiratory acidosis. Uh, so you'll see as we progress through uh, the same formula that's uh, on this slide as your reference used on the next slide. 
Uh, so provided for you a patient's ABG value, and the equation that's listed is the one that matches up with an acute respiratory acidosis from the previous slide. Uh, to make this determination, we first need to determine the expected decrease in pH. Uh, so this is where we simply plug into this uh, formula the measured PCO2 value that we had from our ABG. Uh, so in that, this case, it was the 62 value. And when you crunch those numbers, you get uh, 0.18. Uh, so when we subtract that from uh, the normal value of 7.4, we get 7.22 as the expected pH value. And the actual pH value in this ABG was 7.23. Uh, so in this case, those values were very close, within 10% of each other. Uh, so we uh, can acknowledge that this is a simple metabolic, uh, uh, apologize for the error there, acidosis, not alkalosis, uh, that's present. <laughs> If uh, the actual was greater than expected, then a concomitant metabolic uh, condition would be present, and less than expected, a concomitant metabolic acidosis. Any question about the use of those formulas? I believe we'll have one more opportunity to see that in action. So these mixed acid-base disorders uh, that I referenced. So this is happening if a patient has two or more simple disorders occurring at the same time. Uh, this can be present if the expected compensation has not occurred. Uh, so, uh, for instance, with the last formula, if, if they weren't within 10%, as we saw in that last case, uh, that could be indicative of a mixed disorder being present. And there are a number of very uh, <clears throat> common combinations of the mixed disorders. Um, one example that I commonly see in the ICU um, would be patients with pneumonia as a precipitating cause of diabetic ketoacidosis that could result in both a metabolic and a respiratory acidosis for the patient. The one that's actually been described in the literature as most commonly occurring in combination is the metabolic alkalosis and respiratory alkalosis. Uh, again, in the critically ill patient population that I work with, uh, that could be seen in the setting of uh, hypoxia and perhaps a patient uh, that's requiring significant uh, nasogastric suctioning could present in, in such a way. Have I sufficiently scared everyone? <laughs> we'll retreat uh, from this. Uh, to break this back down into um, each of the individual disorders. We're going to spend some time walking through these, beginning with respiratory acidosis. Uh, with respiratory acidosis, we see the decrease in pH that coincides with that elevated CO2. Uh, remember that's acting as an acid within our patients. Uh, this is uh, typically occurring with that accumulation or retention of PCO2 within the patient. Um, so a common way that happens is in the setting of respiratory failure, um, where uh, they may not be blowing off sufficient amount of that uh, CO2 and have this develop. We also need to consider in these patients if it's acute, being less than 48 hours, or uh, chronic, greater than 48 hours, to have a better sense if they're achieving the expected uh, compensation. Uh, remember, in this situation, uh, the kidneys are playing the role with compensation with the impact on bicarbonate. Uh, so remember, our kidneys are going to be a little bit slow uh, with this uh, taking two to three days to see effect. And in order for that compensation to be complete, um, our patients would need to not have kidney dysfunction. That could impact the ability to compensate. Next, I'm going to look at the causes of acute respiratory acidosis. Uh, and with these um, series of mnemonics that I'll share with you, uh, some of these I had to be creative and create, such as mop head, that's the best I could uh, come up with related to the items. Uh, some are very well known uh, mnemonics that I'll be sharing with you that uh, are published in the literature. Uh, but with this, um, 
we see all of these causes of acute respiratory acidosis uh, being issues that are uh, slowing the rate of breathing or impacting exhalation, so resulting ultimately in that accumulation of PCO2. As nutrition support clinicians, I think it's especially important for us to be aware of overfeeding as an item on this list. Um, overfeeding the total uh, calories can cause that increased hypercapnia uh, to occur due to the excess generation of CO2 uh, related to the oxygen uh, consumption that happens during uh, the metabolism of those carbohydrates. Uh, it's important to keep that in mind, and we'll consider that in some cases as we move forward. As chronic causes, uh, you can remember ACE, uh, and with this, um, there uh, is also accumulation of PCO2 that's happening, uh, but these are tending to be issues that are happening uh, more than 48 hours. Uh, also of note, overfeeding could also be chronic in nature. Um, although not listed on this particular slide. The management of respiratory acidosis uh, tends to depend on if the uh, presentation is acute or chronic in nature. And a recurring theme that we're going to talk about is the importance of addressing that underlying etiology. Uh, it's so critical. Uh, in the acute setting, we can assess the uh, caloric um, amount that we're providing our patients to ensure that we're not overfeeding them with our parenteral or enteral nutrition. And these patients may require ventilator support in order to uh, rid themselves of the submission amount of the PCO2. In chronic conditions, again, treating the underlying cause, uh, these patients may require uh, low flow oxygen and uh, sometimes inhaled bronchodilators and respiratory stimulants uh, to help um, uh, with the reduction of CO2 that they have. Next, we'll consider respiratory alkalosis. With respiratory alkalosis, there's an increase in pH that's happening uh, that coincides with a, a decrease in the PCO2 value as the primary disturbance. And for compensation, uh, the bicarbonate is going to be impacted uh, where we would expect to see that decrease. But the primary etiologies in this case is kind of the uh, counter to what we saw with respiratory acidosis. In this case, with exhalation being increased and more of the PCO2 being blown off, 
uh, to manage that. And we also can help manage their hemodynamics. Uh, it will be important to discontinue chloride-based infusions uh, that could be worsening the acidosis for these patients. Uh, and in some cases, we need to provide some additional um, supplementation of an agent like sodium bicarbonate. Uh, fortunately, if we're able to manage those underlying causes, sodium bicarbonate uh, is rarely required. Um, and also another important point to touch on for nutrition support conditions, uh, we aren't able to add sodium bicarbonate to a parental nutrition bag because of that incompatibility uh, that occurs, but we do have acetate as a salt form in our toolbox precursor to bicarbonate that we could use. As a reference for you, I've provided uh, dosing of bicarbonate uh, that could be used if warranted. Uh, of note, when the pH starts to rise and is at greater than 7.25, we have to be really careful to slow our correction uh, to avoid uh, overcorrecting. And we're going to have to be very vigilant with our monitoring of HCGs in these patients. In some cases, it may be warranted to start renal replacement therapy uh, for these patients with metabolic acidosis. Uh, next, we have metabolic alkalosis. With this condition, we see the elevated pH um, occurring in alignment with the increase in PCO2, I'm sorry, with the increase in bicarbonate and the compensatory response with PCO2. Uh, primary etiologies to keep in mind with this condition, uh, the excessive renal or GI loss of hydrogen. Uh, it could be um, iatrogenic in nature with maybe too much um, bicarbonate that we're providing to the patient. There can also be the loss of chloride in fluid. So keep in mind that the gastric fluid uh, being rich in chloride. And this uh, particular type is then further categorized into saline responsive, which is the most common, or saline resistant. Uh, in these patients, we can do further determination and evaluation of the urine chloride studies, where if they're less than 10, they're saline responsive, and greater than 20, saline resistant. As far as causes of saline responsive metabolic alkalosis, this falls with the mnemonic uh, dampen. Um, diuretics often have those in mind as a pharmacist as a potential cause uh, with medications like uh, furosemide or thiazides. Uh, these can cause that contraction alkalosis if you've heard that term used before in practice. And oftentimes there can be an accompanying hypokalemia that occurs in these patients. Um, there's also other causes listed here that impact uh, chloride loss, um, adenoma of the colon due to chloride, diarrhea, um, hypokalemia, emesis, and nasogastric output all being potential ones. In particular, we have to keep in mind the loss of those gastric fluid contents that can be rich in chloride. <laughs> as far as our saline resistant causes, um, we have a belt as items. Uh, uh, there can be uh, from ingestion of um, something that uh, is worsening this condition, 11-beta-hydroxylase uh, deficiency, excessive mineral corticoid use that uh, causes significant renal hydrogen and potassium depletion, uh, licorice ingestion in excessive quality uh, quantities. Uh, okay, if you have a little licorice here and there. Uh, laxative abuse. Uh, Cushing syndrome and hyperaldosteronism. And then there are some other miscellaneous causes that can come into play uh, excessive bicarb administration, hypomagnesemia, non parathyroid uh, hypercalcemia, and large doses of penicillin that actually act as non resorbable anions uh, leading to that, as well as refeeding syndrome. Uh, so our management of metabolic alkalosis is again going to come back to uh, treating the underlying etiology, uh, considering the severity of the condition. Uh, for saline responsive, uh, we can provide normal saline to replace that intravascular volume. Uh, these patients are often going to need fluoride repletion 
Uh, so if a patient's receiving parental nutrition, this would be a, a case where we could use the chloride salt form uh, rather than acetate. And in severe cases that are persistent um, with a pH uh, greater than 7.6, uh, there could be a potential indication for using hydrochloric acid therapy, uh, which comes up relatively infrequently in practice. Uh, Potassium may be needed to replace the potassium deficits. Uh, acid suppression therapy with something like an H2 receptor um, blocker or proton pump inhibitor can decrease gastric hydrochloric acid production and some of those gastric losses. Uh, an agent like acetylsolamide can help uh, promote bicarbonate excretion um, and can be part of our toolbox. And then in some cases, renal replacement therapy may be needed in severe cases. And then if we consider that other umbrella of saline resistance, in those cases, again, treating the underlying etiology, uh, but in this case, we would be using agents like aldosterone antagonists, like uh, spironolactone, and the use of um, potassium may be needed. So with all of this background information in mind, I wanted to switch gears to spend some time with us uh, systematic and clinical approach to acid-based disorder management. And I wanted to talk through the steps that we would use uh, where you'll uh, first assess the pH, assess the uh, PCO2 and bicarbonate to make a determination if it's a respiratory or metabolic disorder. Uh, three, if we have um, a metabolic acidosis going a step further to consider if we have an anion gap or not. Uh, step four in the setting of respiratory disorders, considering if acute or chronic in nature. Uh, step five would be determining if appropriately compensated or if there is the presence of a mixed disorder. And then six, uh, determining if other metabolic disorders present if we have an anion gap metabolic acidosis. You know, remember our discussion about the delta ratio. And the clinical approach to this uh, as clinicians that we would be keeping in mind um, would be determining the cause of the acid-based disorder. And our review of the patient information is going to be really key uh, to see if we can pull out some of those helpful clues to make that determination. Um, also assessing the severity of the acid-based disorder uh, and can help us uh, have a better idea if therapy would be warranted for the case and then ultimately developing our therapeutic plan for the acid-based disorder. In our time remaining, I want to move through some patient uh, cases together. Uh, for the first one, I think we'll walk through this one together in real time uh, to show you the thought process uh, behind um, this uh, case. So I present to you an adult female with a past medical history of asthma and anxiety that underwent a partial small bowel resection three days ago, secondary to Crohn's disease. She's NPO and receiving parental nutrition and normal saline at 150 milliliters per hour. Uh, to remind you of the notation we'll be using in this problem and some of the others, um, we have the pH of 7.3, uh, PCO2 27, O2 98, and uh, bicarbonate from the ABG 15. And if you're less familiar with the fish bone structure uh, for results of the uh, CHEM 7 across the top uh, at 134 sodium fluoride, 111, uh, BUN 19, uh, 3 potassium, the 15 is the uh, serum bicarbonate and serum creatinine is 1, and the glucose is 115. Uh, so let's think through our um, acid-base disorder that we have present. Uh, so if we do this in a stepwise approach, uh, first, let's make a determine about the uh, pH. Uh, so the value of 7.3, would that uh, be uh, reflective of acidemia or alkalinemia? <laughs> Let's see, how, how many votes did I have for acidemia? Any votes for acidemia? Good. Uh, so in this case, we have the low pH value uh, that is aligned with acidemia, very good, being less than that 7.35 to 7.45 normal range. 
uh, as step two, <clears throat> we need to consider uh, the PCO2 values and the serum bicarbonate value uh, to make a determination if this is metabolic or uh, respiratory in nature. Uh, so in this case, we have the PCO2 of uh, 27, and we have the bicarbonate value of 15. Based on that information, do you think this would be um, metabolic? Do we have any votes for that? Or any votes for respiratory? So maybe a little bit of uncertainty here. Um, so to think through this thought process, in this case, the value of 15 is being less than 24. <clears throat> so that does uh, suggest that that's aligned with an acidosis occurring uh, related um, uh, to the metabolic portion being disturbed. Uh, in this case, our assessment of PCO2, uh, so that value being 27. Uh, so in an acidosis, what would you expect the PCO2 to be? High. So remember, that's functioning like an acid. Um, so this value of 27 would be kind of counter to what you would expect to find in an acidosis. So that helps uh, as you're doing that interpretation of PCO2 and bicarbonate uh, to push us back uh, toward this being a metabolic process. Uh, so in this case, we do have a metabolic acidosis, so we have to uh, figure out our anion gap. Uh, so remember, this would be the sodium and subtracting the chloride and bicarbonate. don't have your calculator with you, I'll spare you on this one, uh, that would come to eight. Uh, so that would be a non-anion gap uh, metabolic acidosis. And in this particular case, we don't need to consider acute versus chronic because it wasn't a respiratory condition. Uh, if you were to plug this in our handy dandy compensation formula, uh, you would see that uh, the expected value and the actual value are actually very close. So this is a simple disorder. Any questions about that determination for this case? Uh, so what do you think is the most likely cause of this acid base disorder? Uh, so knowing that this is a metabolic acidosis that is non-anion gap. And we have uh, the clues that were provided about presentation. Have any votes for A, B, C, or D? <coughs> all right, it's always the pesky fluids getting in the way. Um, so we see, and from the context clues of the case, the patient was getting a significant amount of normal saline on an ongoing basis. But when we think about the other possible causes that were listed here, uh, asthma being more aligned with a chronic respiratory acidosis, anxiety, respiratory alkalosis, uh, kidney failure, uh, anion gap, uh, metabolic acidosis. So the fluoride use would be the most reasonable option from that list. Although keep in mind, there could be a number of different uh, potential etiologies. So next, I want us to consider uh, the salt form that we'd be using within our uh, parental nutrition formulation. So assuming we've provided already uh, the appropriate phosphate dose, uh, thinking about the salt forms were the sodium and potassium. Take a moment to consider this, and as you're thinking about your approach to this patient with metabolic acidosis, I do want to acknowledge that different institutions will use a different approach to the management of the salts within the parental nutrition that we can talk through. I'm assuming she's still on the um, whole saline? Um, at the point you made this determination, yes. So how many would vote for A, C, or I skip B? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think there are a couple of different things you can do in this case. Uh, and this is where I spoke to some of the institutional uh, variability in managing this. Uh, I was trained in a setting where we were doing a uh, daily interpretation of the acid-base status and daily changes 
uh, to our uh, simulation. Uh, so with that in mind, I feel comfortable going all in uh, one way or the other with acetate or chloride if we have uh, an imbalance one way or the other. Um, so I tend to go with all acetate in a case like this, knowing that you have to have the very close ongoing evaluation uh, to, to make sure you don't overshift. Um, I've learned from conversations with other institutions, some will continue to use a split approach to the salt form, but would likely favor acetate with their um, uh, split uh, with the salt process there to avoid over uh, shifting. Would your answer change if we discontinue the normal saline? Great question. So the question, would my approach change if we uh, discontinue the normal saline? I think in, in this case, based on uh, how I've managed someone with a, uh, acidemia being present, I would still feel comfortable going all in with acetate with the careful ongoing uh, uh, observation of laboratory data and determination if and when the point we need to uh, definitely add back in fluoride to the formulation, uh, but knowledge that can be handled different ways. Great discussion. Uh, so next, I have another uh, case to consider. So we Great. Um, so a point was made regarding the impact of acid-based status on uh, potassium, and I think uh, that's a really important point uh, that that can impact uh, uh, the shifting of the electrolytes and the electrolyte concentration. Um, so I think you bring up a very good point about the ongoing need, along with monitoring the uh, ABG values, the ongoing close um, interpretation of electrolyte values. Thanks for, for bringing that one up to this. So yeah, so um, just have to be careful when you correct an episode. Um, you might get a hypo and remium, but sometimes you might need to correct the just yeah. And even in concert, uh, I guess as you're thinking about uh, the electrolytes that you're putting into your formulation, uh, you know, and a person like this that has a uh, good renal function at this point, we could be proactive in thinking about that as well. Great point. I think in the interest of time for the next uh, uh, case, uh, these will be in your packet and available for review. I just want to uh, jump to a case that will give us a, a chance to look at a compensation case. Uh, so for this uh, problem, case number four, we have a home a, a patient receiving internal nutrition that presents with intractable vomiting and anxiety uh, regarding her condition and a past medical history of insulin-dependent diabetes. And we have uh, vital information and laboratory data available for you. Uh, so I wanted to walk you through the thought process and how you would make the determination that this would be a mixed disorder. So if we think through our systematic approach, we see that the pH is 7.48, which would be in aligned with alkalemia. For step two, um, in assessing the PCO2 and the bicarbonate, we saw that the serum bicarbonate was elevated, uh, greater than 24, suggesting a metabolic process. In this case, step three, and step four were applicable for our consideration. Uh, but this is where we would pull in the formula from the table we reviewed together, and we would determine the expected PCR2 uh, value. Um, and if you plug the information into that formula, we would see that the actual value of 40 was less than the expected of 53.3. Uh, so in this case, we have a concomitant respiratory alkalosis that's happening in addition to the uh, primary disorder. Any questions about that? Again, I just wanted to pull back for your attention that if you wanted to evaluate a mixed disorder, uh, you can draw back on that reference table uh, with the uh, compensation formulas. Uh, 
And I'll make sure that the, this particular handout uh, with the additional information answered uh, selections um, for the other cases will be provided for you as a reference uh, to review later. Uh, but I think it's some key takeaways, keeping in mind that the clinical evaluation of these patients is essential. Uh, we really have to put on our detective hats as nutrition support clinicians. Uh, we can be systematic in our approach. And if you tackle it from that stepwise approach, it becomes a little bit less intimidating uh, to consider some of these acid-based disorders and draw on those references that are available, um, uh, considering the compensation table formula uh, that can be used. And then uh, always considering management of those underlying etiologies and the supportive therapies that we can provide these patients. I believe we're at the end of our time for this session, but I'll be around for the rest of the day and be happy uh, to discuss with you further. If we have any questions online, I'd be happy to answer those now as well, too. I don't see any online right now. And thank you for the great discussion. I think those were great cases. And um, as she said, they are in your packet. So please feel free to go through them. If you have any questions, you can either email her or um, you can email us at the GAS website or on the email address. We're going to take another 10 minute break and we'll reconvene at 11 o'clock.